So as you've just noticed that um, the meeting's being recorded for training and promotional purposes, and that will go on to our Apologies there, everybody. Uh, I think we've lost Richard. Um, I think he's just dropped out. Um, so we'll just wait for Richard just to return. Apologies for that. Um, hopefully it won't be too long. Looks like there's a connection issue. Uh, if not, obviously, can I hand over to you, John, just to take us through and just introduce uh, Chris? Uh, but we'll just give Richard a, a second. He might not be having a connection issue. Yeah. Um, no problem. Thanks, John. Um, Mm -hmm. John, do you want to hand over to Chris then and we'll uh, make a start? Can you do that, Paul? Sorry, where are we? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So, Chris, if you want to start the presentation. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> sorry. Good evening, everybody. Hopefully you can all see the my presentation up on the screen or my opening page. Yeah, fantastic. Um, good evening. Um, I'll, uh, my name's Chris Chittock. Um, I'll give you a bit of detail on who I am. Um, but the talk I'm going to do this evening is on um, human effects of vibra and vibration in the workplace. So human effects of vibration and vibration in the workplace. Um, so if you've got any questions, I believe um, they're being collated. Um, through um, uh, through um, IOSH and, and they'll be put to me at the end, I believe. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, that's correct, Chris. Yeah. Fantastic. So, um, if I can get everything to do what it's supposed to do, there we go. So, um, a little bit about company and me. Um, we're uh, principally an acoustics, noise and vibration consultancy firm, uh, offices in York and Birmingham. Um, we diversified as a company into other areas. So we deal, we, we do deal with things like dust and uh, a, a bit of element fume work, um, odor, air quality, etc. Um, but um, Principally, our, our main core of our focus is, is noise and vibration. Um, so established in 2007, um, over the years, we've um, uh, focused and specialised on a number of areas, although we deal with general acoustics right across the board. Um, we've sort of focused in on, on areas particularly such as wind turbine noise and noise associated with licensed premises and hospitality premises, which is been interesting in this past year um, and uh, large event noise monitoring. Um, so we're a, we're a small company, we're a small acoustics consultancy, we're a private consultancy. So we've, we've currently got a team of nine, um, but we think we sort of hit the sweet spot in terms of being big enough to be able to respond to a client a client's requirements, but small enough to be able to offer a, a very personalised and and particularly very efficient service. So that's that's the company. And there'll be at the end of the presentation, there'll be some contact details should you wish to get in touch with us. A little bit about me. Um, so I've been an acoustic consultant for 18, 19 years now. Um, since 2000, well, nearly, nearly 20 actually, more likely. Um, late 2001, I went into acoustics consultancy. Um, so I am a, I've got a degree in what's called audio technology from the University of Salford, which is basically acoustics, um, but with um, a little bit of um, uh, electronics uh, thrown in there. Um, and um, I, one of my particular areas of specialism is um, occupational noise and vibration. Um, I have, Provided, I mean, I've, I've said extensive expert testimony. Um, the heat, 
in relation to occupational noise and vibration, I've probably completed more than 100 reports on, um, on historical occupational noise and vibration exposure, um, as well as actually um, real world assessing occupational noise and vibration exposure um, within premises. The, the big advantage that we have as specialist acousticians um, is the a real depth of technical knowledge and understanding about the, um, uh, the physics behind um, occupational noise and vibration in particular um, and the mechanisms so that we can actually advise in terms of mitigation the first step is always to look at how you manage those mechanical means. So um, uh, for the past two years, um, for my sins, I have also, I lecture at Leeds Beckett University on a part-time basis, um, teaching the Institute of Acoustics, a diploma in acoustics and noise control. Um, I would encourage anybody, if you're looking for someone to deal with any noise or vibration issue um, for you, I would always be looking for that person that's dealing with that to be either a member or an associate member of the Institute of Acoustics. Um, that um, to be a member of the Institute of Acoustics, you, you have to um, demonstrate to a committee of your peers that you've got the knowledge and experience and technical capability to achieve um, in my instance, corporate member, which is the, the highest grade above fellow. Um, I'm not old enough for fellow yet. I haven't been kicking around for long enough, um, but um, the um it, it is a an independent assessment um not dependent on per se how much you pay so uh it, it's a great way of assure, of checking and, and assuring that you're getting someone that knows what they're doing so we'll get into the meat of the, today's topic human vibration principally um occupation from an, on an occupational standpoint um we're going to look at human vibration in the workplace, both forms, both hand arm vibration and to a certain extent, whole body vibration. Um, we'll go through the mechanisms, how that vibration enters the body, what it does, the effects um, and some of the symptoms in terms of hand arm vibration syndrome. Um, and we'll bro broadly look at the same for whole body and just discuss a little bit about um, or I'll discuss a little bit about um, the differences between the two and in particular the level of, should we say, um, the level of the science around the two disciplines um, and um, the level of knowledge that we have. Um, so, hand arm vibration. Simply put, vibration that enters the body through these bad boys, the hands. Um, principally a problem from handheld power tools. There are other means of generating handheld vibration in terms of uh, holding a workpiece that's being um, pr pressed onto a vibrating tool. Um, but principally, and the main cause of exposure in the workplace is handheld powered tools, be they air, electric or petrol driven. Um, now, the, the, free, the damaging vibration occurs in the frequencies in the range from one hertz, low as one hertz, all the way up to a thousand hertz, but particularly the frequencies which we see the most damage in and that cause the most issue are those in the brackets from 20 to 250 hertz. Um, so generally, low frequency is what we're interested in. Anything above 250 hertz is mid to high frequency, but 250 and below, that's what we're talking about in terms of low frequencies. So when we say um, uh, handheld power tools, what do we mean? So just some examples. Um, and the, these are probably three of the biggest industries in which we see issues around um, uh, power tools. Um, Forestry and forestry, horticulture and halt there. Forestry, horticulture and agriculture. Try saying that three times fast. Um, it's not the top because they are, shall we say, one of the worst offenders. Um, as an industry, there is um, 
potential for huge vibration exposure there. Historically, poor control and monitoring. Um, and I know that's a sweeping aspersion, but that's the reality is, is that as an industry, it's, it's the most poorly monitored, particularly because majority of the work within those three industries does not go on within a workplace. It goes on within a, a work site. So it's away from that constant monitoring of, of the workplace. And it more often than not boils down to the individual to, to monitor their own exposure. So we've got chainsaws, strimmers, brush saws. Um, we'll touch a bit more on strimmers in a bit, but they are um, probably one of the worst offenders, um, only, only surmounted really by long handled um, hedge trimmers. So engineering, we've got things like grinders, handheld grinders, everybody's seen one of those in actions, polishers, things like chipping hammers, and then in things like construction, quarrying and demolition. So percussion drills, uh, needle guns, which are generally used for removing things like um, concrete from metal and um, masonry saws, steel saws, uh, as they're commonly known, handheld petrol driven machinery. So those are just some good examples of the type of tool that, we're going, that, that you would see. So what is hand arm, hand -arm vibration syndrome? Um, and we'll look at that. Hand arm vibration syndrome is a, a blanket term that covers a variety of different symptoms and a variety of different causal elements within those within that range of symptoms. So we're going to run through those. Principally, hand arm vibration can be broken down into three components. The vascular, so that's, that's the um, arteries and veins, the blood system within the body. Neurological, so when we're talking about neurological, we're talking about um, the nervous system and musculoskeletal, so talking about muscles and skeleton and um, uh, uh, tendons and ligaments etc so we're talking about the body's framework the body's scaffolding so we'll have a look at those so the first one we'll have a look at is the vascular component so when we see vascular issues associated associated with hand arm vibration it's probably the most commonly known um, symptom from hand arm vibration and that's vibration white finger um, now, vibration white finger is where we see a blanching of the fingers, usually up to and around individual joints. Um, and it's a form of Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, that's um, Raynaud's phenomenon is um, uh, a blanching caused by uh, and a restriction of the um, blood vessels in in Medical Raynaud's, it's normally caused by um, effects such as cold uh, and constriction of the vessels due to cold. Um, but in vibration white finger, it's, it's caused by the effects of vibration on those tiny blood vessels within the digits. Um, initially, it will be seen as a blanching in just the tips of the fingers. Um, so, so, sort of thing that you get by pressing your fingers onto a flat, hard, flat surface, and you'd start to see the fingertips blanch after a while. Um, as it progresses, it will work its way down the finger, and it normally works from the little finger across, rather than from the main digit down. And the reason for that is principally because it's actually, um, if any of you have ever done what I did at one point in my life and break your little finger, what you realize is that how much of the, your grip strength comes from those two fingers on your hands. So as the condition progresses, attacks become, become progressively more frequent and affect more fingers and joints. It's also exacerbated by other factors that we'll talk about, such as cold. Um, so the neurological component. So we can see damage to the nerves. Um, that damage to the nerves um, shows up as a result, shows up as persistent numbness. Again, normally spreading out from the heel of the hand up into the first two fingers, you, you have two main nerves serving your hand, 
one that serves those two fingers and one that serves those three. Um, and the um, you'll, it'll be seen in the, in the, from the smallest fingers first. That numbness then results in a loss of manual dexterity. You can't hold properly what you can't feel. And it can then result in secondary injuries such as burns brought about by um, basically, um, if you like, cack-handedness because of a lack of sensation in the fingers. So finally, the musculoskeletal component. So this is probably the, should we say, the second most well-known um, element of um, hand-arm vibration, uh, and that's carpal tunnel syndrome. So um, carpal tunnel, which is the uh, space within the wrist that the nerves pass through to go into the hand, um, is um, becomes uh, effectively swelling around that, causes the nerves to press into the bone and the nerves start to, um, causing nerve pain and or nerve damage if, you, if the issue is allowed to persist. Um, we can also see things such as um, joint damage, cysts in the joint, um, muscle wasting and loss of grip strength tend to be as a result of vascular and neurological components, then it subsequently affecting the musculoskeletal structure because of the damage to those nerves. Um, the, uh, the other one that, that, that's probably more commonly seen, kind box is, is pretty rare, but um, as is uh, dipterans contracture, but dipterans contracture is more, um, is something that's more widely known. Um, um, uh, and dipterans contracture is when we see a contraction in the um, tendons, um, particularly again, on the um, lower half of the hand, causing the lower two fingers to curl inwards. Um, and the best, um, the best example you can see at that uh, of um, um, Dupturin's contracture in, in, out in the world um, is, is Bill Nighy, who suffer, who's a sufferer of the condition, um, who's famous for his kind of point like that that he does. Um, and the reason for that is because he has difficulty in actually straightening out his, uh, those two fingers, uh, the little and ring finger. So uh, those are the kind of things that you can expect to see. So I'm just going to very much touch on this because it's not my area specialist in the Stockholm scale. This is what will generally be used by medical practitioners to actually um, grade and quantify the extent to which someone is suffering from um, hand arm vibration syndrome. Uh, and you can see there it goes from stage zero up to stage, up to stage four um, for the vascular component and zero to stage three for the sensorineural component. So um, vascular component, again, obviously the um, blood vessels in the fingers and the sensorineural component, the nerves in the fingers. Um, and the grading um, indicates the level to which someone might be exposed. So if you've got someone within your workplace who already has hand arm vibration exposure and that you're managing, then they should have a grading that they can provide to you that, that sets out the extent to which they are injured. So we talked about Hand arm vibration, uh, hand arm vibration syndrome, and what it actually is. So, how do we assess it? How do we understand it? And how do we understand whether or not someone is going to is likely to be injured in a manner that will cause those conditions? Well, we simply put, we need to measure it. Um, now, hand arm vibration is a is a hand arm vibration syndrome comes as a result of exposure to hand-arm vibration. Um, and the extent to which hand-arm vibration injures is a function of the level of the vibration and the duration of exposure. So to know how much vibration someone's exposed to, we need to understand the level of the vibration and the exposure duration. So the first thing we'll look at is, is actually the level. So First thing you need to do is you need to measure the vibration with an appropriate piece of equipment. Now, um, my, uh, my advice, 
as a qualified acoustician would always be to employ someone that is appropriately qualified and has the appropriate competencies to be able to know not just that they're doing it right, but critically that they're not doing it wrong. Um, now, that might sound like a distinction without a difference, but it's very, it's much easier to learn how, it's e I say easy, it's easier to learn how to do a process and to replicate that process. The critical thing is, what is, is when you know, is knowing whether or not what you're doing is right in the context and you're being able to justify the decisions you're making about how you're undertaking a measurement. And that for me is critical, is can the professional in that, that competent professional justify why they've made decisions in how they've undertaken measurements? Um, that's an argument I've had with the HSC on more than one occasion as to whether or not what they want to see done is actually the most effective and competent way to measure the hand arm vibration in the context. I can't think of any instances when I haven't won. So um, it's about making sure that you are, you are able to, to assert your competence. If you don't feel you can have that discussion and assert that competence, I would always recommend employing another party that does. So you need the right equipment. So knowing that you've got the right thing in the first instance, you then need to measure the levels at the measure the vibration levels at the tool handle at the grip point. You need to use a representative measurement time, and that could be very short to very long, depending on what you're doing. And you need to consider the exposure time, the exposure period, otherwise known as anger time or trigger time. How long is the person actually being exposed to vibration levels? Typically, if you ask a tool user, how long have you used that tool for? The answer you will get will be, I've used it all day. I used it all morning. I've used it for the past hour. They will give you the amount of time they have been working on a process, not the amount of time that they have actually had that tool in that hand. Now, I've had a lot of solicitors ask me in the past, well, can we assume a 50% exposure time? You could, but I'm not going to justify that because it simply wouldn't be accurate. Um, there is no way of assuming exposure time. Um, and the old adage of to assume makes an ass of you and me in that instance is, is quite apt, which is to say that um, exposure time will vary dramatically depending on the type of process. Someone that's do, undertaking a, a process um, a good example is, is building in a metalwork context. Um, their actual exposure time is probably quite a bit less than they think it is, because there will be a lot of time spent prepping the workpiece and very little time actually spent with the tool in hand. Whereas if you look at the context of, for example, a road worker, their exposure time, their, their trigger time, actually tends to be towards the higher end of the range because they tend to be working on a process for a longer period. You know, if you think about a guy with a jackhammer digging a hole in the road, he's going to work on around that hole until he's finished it. That might take him half an hour, that might take him an hour, but he's, he's unlikely to have significant breaks in that process to set up and move on to the next step. So, First thing we need to do is we need to measure. So whenever we do a measurement of noise or vibration, we apply a weighting to it. Now, in the vast majority of instances, this is done automatically by your piece of measurement equipment nowadays. Um, it is for all of ours. Um, it's, not a, it's not something that will be applied um, that you would need to apply manually anymore. Um, but much with noise, and you may have heard about A weighting with noise and, and that that reflects the human response to sound. Well, with vibration, um, we have a hand arm vibration frequency weighting known as WH, um, and that frequency weighting reflects the frequencies that make the greatest contribution to um, um, vibration. 
um, in terms of human exposure. So we have this, this exposure awaiting WH. Um, it's probably wrong. I'll say that now from the outset. Um, this, this weighting was produced 30 years ago, I think. Um, what we now know has moved on and it's probably not quite right, but we're going to keep using it anyway. It's what we've got. Um, it's better than not using it. Um, and um, it's unlikely to be readily changed at this point um, uh, by agreement from um, uh, across what would need to be ideally ISO agreement rather than the BSI agreement nowadays. So um, it's unlikely to change in the near future, but understand that it's probably not as right as it could be. So making our measurements, we attach the accelerometer to a, um, the handle of the instrument. And um, I'd love to have had an instrument to hold up at this point. I love waving things around, but unfortunately ours are all in use. Um, but the, um, the accelerometer is, is normally uh, fixed to a metal block um, and normally to a bracket, and that's attached to the tool handle. Now, there are lots of different ways of attaching an accel the accelerometer onto a tool. Um, some are the, the, the more rigid the fixing, the better, because the more rigid the fixing to the to the tool, the more direct the transfer function between the tool and the accelerometer, the more accurate the measurement. So the most accurate way of affixing your um, accelerometer to your tool is to bolt it or glue it to it. That's great if you are fixing an accelerometer for condition monitoring of a piece of equipment, but if you're trying to do HABS measurements on 30 tools in a day, that's going to be pretty laborious, pretty work intensive, use a lot of equipment, use a lot of glue and generally make a mess of your tools. So it is a question of doing your best. And this is what I mean by justifying. We will generally use um, high grade zip ties, thick, long and wide zip ties that, excuse me, can be tightened up as tight as possible will allow for a firm solid fixing to the instrument but are easily removed um, for future working. Even going back as far as the start of my career, believe it or not, and, I, and I've so been in this industry about 20 years, um, back, way back then we actually used to still fix things to tools using gobs of beeswax, um, which was the most labour intensive process. Critical things don't disable safety features, so it mustn't, um, um, that mustn't um, disable any guards or any controls or safety switches, um, shouldn't interfere with normal working, wouldn't be the first time um, that uh, I can hold my hands up more than once in my life, I've managed to zip tie over a, uh, a power switch on a, on a tool. Um, and. The accelerometer ideally wants to be mount, in, mounted in line with one of the axes, so in line with an axis of the handle. You'll also find you've got a really fine cable on your accelerometer. Just be careful with that. They're very easily broken and easily damaged. Um, and um, it's very easy to realise you've not damaged it until you've done a load of measurements and realise that the results you've got are distorted. So I've got some examples there of fixings to tools. Um, and you can see there the uh, fixing with a uh, cable tie and also the example of direct fixing to a metal block or direct fixing to a piece of uh, a workpiece in the bottom left hand corner of the screen there. Um, they're all examples of, of good fixings. Um, now, the only example I would give you there that I would say is not an example of good fixing is the top left hand corner because the fixing has been the, the um, accelerometer has been mounted to the handle and not to the grip. You would always, always mount to the grip. The operator is going to hold the grip, not the bare handle. Um, likewise, though, 
if operators don't actually use the grip properly, if the way they use the tool is um, technically incorrect, but that's the habit, I would always measure both the correct way to hold the tool and the way people actually hold the tool. Excuse me taking a quick drink. So you've got a triaxial accelerometer, it's measuring vibration along three different axes, X, Y, and Z on all three directions. Finally, and again, the meter will generally do this for you, but it's good to understand what it's doing. Um, you need to work out your vector sum, um, your actual direction, your actual quantity of your vibration um, in the, along the vector, that, that the actual vibrating axis of the instrument. Um, so in, to do so, we, act, we calculate the vector sum, which combines the vibration in all three vectors um, into one overall value. Um, and we give thanks to Pythagoras for his rule there. So once we've calculated our vector sum, so we've got our AHV value, which hopefully our sound level meter, our sound level, our vibration meter will spit out for us. We then need to calculate our daily dose. Now, our daily dose is um, a function of our, as we said before, our level of vibration and our duration of exposure. We always referenced against an eight, we always reference against an eight hour working day. So if someone's exposed to um, vibration for one hour of the working day, then um, T in that equation will be placed with the one. If they're exposed for eight hours of the working day, T in that equation will be replaced with eight. If they work a 12 hour day, a 12 hour shift, then T in that equation will be replaced with 12, but the eight on the bottom does not change. The, the, the averaging duration, the dose calculation duration doesn't change depending on the length of the shift. It is fixed at an eight hour reference point. And it's a mistake that people quite often make. So give you an example. Um, when I do a version of this presentation for, for my students, there's, there's a lot more, there's a lot more mass examples in them, but we've just got one for you guys tonight. Um, so an employee is using a hand tool for approximately three hours a day, and that's an acceleration of four and a half meters per second, um, which is measured at the handle while it is in use. Estimate the eight hour exposure level. So we want to know our A8 value. So we've got um, our, our exposure calculation, our exposure formula AH3 multiplied by the square root of T over eight. So our acceleration, our AHV value is four and a half meters per second, four and a half meters per second squared. Our exposure of duration is three, replaces our T value. Um, and our, so it gives us a resulting exposure level of 2.76 meters per second squared. So that is our, our, that's an A8 value. So that's not an acceleration value per se. It is an acceleration because it's in meters per second squared, but it is a dose value and that's key to, so key to explain. So if you're expressing that as a number, it will be 2.76 meters per second to the power of minus two, A brackets eight, close brackets. So you would must always put that reference that it is an A8, an, exp, an eight hour exposure, um, rather than um, a magnitude. Similarly, we can, we can do the calculation the other way. Um, and it's very useful to look at this because it gives you an understanding of how vibration dose accrues. Um, in similar way to noise, albeit that the, the multiplier is different. So if we want to know our maximum exposure duration, we can rearrange that equation for, uh, for T to give us a max value. So our daily dose divided by our magnitude squared multiplied by eight gives us our maximum exposure duration um, during the day. Um, so, the table at the bottom of the screen there just gives you a cross reference. So as you can see, 
if you've got an exposure time of half an hour, your maximum uh, your maximum magnitude of vibration, your RMS vibration level, root mean square vibration level that you could be exposed to for that 30 minutes is 10, 10 meters per second squared. If you then, um, uh, if you then take one, increase that exposure duration to two hours, you've, you've quadrupled your duration, you half your period of exposure and so on and so forth. So um, it's not a linear um, relationship. Um, uh, that's key to remember. So having a having a um, um, having a ready reckoner like that can be very useful for just understanding the, the overall durations of exposure and whether or not you might have a an overall problem based on a reference, for example, a uh, a manufacturer's data uh, manufacturer's data for a tool, which we'll talk about in a bit more depth in a minute. So to give you some examples of typical AHV values. And those are fairly representative of some of the values that you could get off of those different tools um, and the type of exposure durations that you could expect to see. Um, we're at the end of the presentation, we'll talk about the legislation in a little bit of detail, and we'll talk a bit about exposure limit values and exposure action values and what they mean. But exposure limit value is the point at which you, you have to take action as an employer and the exposure action value is your um, um, exposure limit value. So apologies, exposure action value is the point at which you have to take action as an employer. And exposure limit value is the maximum that you're allowed to expose your employees to under any circumstances. Um, just a, an anecdotal piece of information um, for you. In relation to a streamer there, one of the one of the biggest culprits we see um, for excessive hand down vibration, as I mentioned earlier, are streamers and long handled hedge trimmers. Um, the um, in terms of the streamers, um, the um, can everybody still hear me? Okay. Yes, that's yes, fine, Chris. Yes. Just checking. I was just checking my screen hadn't frozen up. Um, so, um, in relation to in relation to streamers and um, uh, long handle hedge trimmers, um, we always try and um, dig a little when we go to clients' premises. And um, I was doing so, uh, doing some hand arm vibration measurements for the um, grounds team for a large large English university, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, and um, they, they, they'd all brought out their tools for us to have a look at within each different team. And we, um, I noticed there were a number of, number of tools sort of at the back of the cage and like, what are those ones? Oh, they're the ones no one likes. Why does no one like them? Oh, because they vibrate a lot. Right. Can we have those ones out, please? Um, and one of the streamers, the, the vibration magnitude on this streamer was so high. I did a quick bit of mental mental arithmetic while I was um, stood there. Um, the, a user of this streamer would have reached his exposure limit value um, uh, on that streamer for the day in 90 seconds. Um, I took that streamer straight up to uh, straight up to the uh, foreman's office and suggested it find its way into a bin pretty pronto. Um, so I do see some pretty extreme cases. For the most part, um, they're not, but I do see some pretty extreme cases. So vibration dose reduction. How can we reduce? We've quantified the exposure. We know what people are exposed to. How can we reduce it? Well, the first thing we can do is eliminate the risk. Do you have to use a handheld tool for that job? Can it be done with something else? Now, for the most part, 
generally the answer to that is, well, yes, we do have to use a handheld tool for that job. So how can we reduce the vibration levels? The, that can be done through selection of tools um, or through reduction in, in terms of a change of tool or a different ma manufacturer of tool, whether or not a different type of tool will generate different levels. We can reduce exposure times. Can we share that job? Can it be split between two or three employees? Can those employees be put on rotation so that they're working on different tasks and therefore they're not all being, what one individual isn't being exposed to all the vibration. We can also look at limiting the transfer of vibrating energy to the hand arm system. Now that can be done through things such as um, using mounts or um, dampers for, for tools and instruments to prevent the transfer of vibration into the individual's body. Um, the other thing you can do is in terms of mitigating, it's not really a dose reduction process per se, because you wouldn't use, you wouldn't consider it in the assessment of dose, but in the practical reduction of an individual's dose, the one, th one of the other things you can look at is circulation maintenance. So obviously we've talked about the, um, the vascular component damaging, the, damaging those blood vessels. Um, those blood vessels are more readily damaged when they are already in a state of constriction. They're already in a state of constriction if you've got cold hands. So if you keep your hands warm, then you can minimize the risk of any damage occurring. You won't prevent it, but you can minimize the, the re, any resultant damage that met, um, from exposure to halves. Even exposure to halves at what is deemed an acceptable level, you can still better protect yourself through keeping your circulation going. So that means keeping the hands warm, working in a warmer environment and so on and so forth. Um, PPE. Now, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of manufacturers and sellers of PPE for halves, principally um, gloves um, for dealing with hand arm vibration. I will put this in simple terms, do not use it. Is ineffective and, in, and we'll discuss in a minute in some conditions can make exposure worse. So we talked some vibration reduction techniques. Top left hand screen there we've got a um, one methodology which is a harness um, or a, a hanging damper so the actual unit is hung on a damper so that the grip on the tool doesn't have to be as tight um, and the damper absorbs some of the vibrating energy of the tool um, and it then keeps the, the tool will then return to a safe hanging position at the end. Um, you can see there within the steel chainsaw it's the, the handle is mounted on an anti-vibration mount so the, the, there is a damper within the uh, uh, within the body of the chainsaw there. Um, similarly with the um, uh, with the jackhammer that you've got in the bottom right there, you've also got that, that jackhammer has got a damper mounted handle, so the handle is effectively on a suspension system. One of the best methodologies for reducing hand arm vibration exposure for um, strimmers is to put it on a harness. The harness acts as a really effective um, damper for but for vibration being generated in the engine behind the operator and, and having that hanging point is a really effective damper. The vibration travels up into the harness, is effectively absorbed by the body, but in a manner that's not impacting on um, the, uh, either the musculoskeletal or the cardiovascular system. Um, and it means the vibration isn't passed through to the grip points on the handles. Um, always avoid strimmers which use a rear mounted hand position with the, the strimmer sitting with a rear mounted position outside or any other tools that place the grip next to the motor. Um, they generally have by far the highest hand arm vibration levels. Um, I'm going to try and shoot through the last few slides because I know I'm, I, this is, this is uh, 
Um, I'm overrunning slightly, and apologies. Um, data from tool suppliers. It's a useful comparison, but do not rely on it. Um, manufacturers are required to measure the vibration levels generated by tools. That's done to an ISO standardized methodology, but it is a standardized test procedure. The best example I can give for um, what that means in practice is, I'm sure many of you will be aware of, under the old system that we had for um, measuring um, fuel economy on cars, you'd look in a car manufacturer's brochure and say, this car does 40 miles to the gallon. Actually, in practice, it would do 30. The reason for that, that was a standardized procedure. It bore little relation to actual real life, real world use of the car. It's exactly the same here with, with, with vibration levels for tools. Great tool for comparing different vibration levels of the same tool from different manufacturers because it's a standardized process, but not good for actually assessing what the vibration magnitude is that the individual using the tool will be exposed to. Uh, in particular, and the mantra I always repeat is, if the tool involves the use of a bit, be it a blade, a chisel, any kind of um, uh, uh, reciprocating belt or blade or sanding or sanding face or vibrating face then that's the action of a of a tool on a workpiece and that will directly affect the level of vibration generated by that tool um, and reliance on the manufacturer's data is just not advisable i mentioned anti-vibration gloves um do not use them um, whilst they ostensibly can work in the short term, in fact, they can result in increased vibration exposure. There's a loss of grip strength because of a lack of sensation to the tool, and that results in extra gripping uh, or forcing into the tool or the, or the piece of equipment. Um, they're not to be regarded as an effective measure to reduce hand down vibration exposure, but they do keep your hands warm. So my recommendation would be, if you're going to use gloves as a form of PPE, absolutely use them to keep the hands warm. Do not use them as a form of mitigation for hand arm vibration. So just before we skip into looking at whole body quickly, um, those are the standards and guidelines that um, related to the um, some of the bits we've talked about going through this bit of the presentation. So whole body vibration, how does it differ? Well, one of the big things to understand is we know a lot about halves. Um, and I've just done a whole piece on the neurological, uh, musculoskeletal and vascular components. We know what it does to the body. We know how it acts on the body. We know how it injures. And we, we know that mechanism of injury. With respect to whole, whole body vibration, there are a whole raft of symptoms that are attributed to exposure to whole body vibration from um, visual perception, discomfort, um, interference with motor skills, motion sickness, um, digestive issues, female reproductive issues. All of these things have been attributed in some form to whole body vibration. And there is no clear mechanism of injury for many of those, in, for many of those conditions between exposure and um, extent of injury. There's no Stockholm scale here. That's an example of the effect of someone being exposed to whole body vibration and how that vibration impacts on motor effects of them just trying to write a sentence as they get exposed to increasing frequencies and increasing magnitudes of vibration. And as you can see there, the biggest impact by far is increasing magnitude of whole body vibration. Whole body vibration exposure comes in a variety of different ways, principally and most often through use of vehicles, be that off-road vehicles, concrete, um, concrete um, carrying vehicles, quarrying, groundworks vehicles, grounds maintenance. They're particular, they can particularly be an issue. Things like ride on lawnmowers that are not equipped with significant suspension can be a significant issue for whole body vibration. Um, Whole body vibration enters is generally considered as entering through the feet, the buttocks, the backside, the back in a sitting position, occasionally through the headrest, although it's not a major uh, source of transference. Um, 
and through the back in a recumbent position. The main ones that you'll see there will be the top three, the feet, the buttocks and the back. Measurement in exactly the same way in general principle, it's measured through use of a triaxial accelerometer, but this time mounted in what's commonly termed as a, a well, not properly termed as a seat pad, but most widely known as a whoopee cushion. Um, because it's mounted in a large rubber disc um, and that can be placed either on the seat and sat on or on the floor and stood on. Just a note, whole body vibration should always be monitored with the operator in place. You shouldn't monitor whole body vibration without an operator in situ. Someone should always be sat on, stood on the pad. Um, a particular um, kind of like micro uh, specialism within um, whole body vibration exposure is one of motion sickness. It's a particular issue um, and it particularly comes in at very, very low frequency. Um, and in the different individuals are affected in different ways. Believe it or not, there is actually an ISO standard specifically relating to motion and sickness, ISO 2631. And it has this rather fantastic um, and rather detailed calculation, allowing you to calculate the percentage of people who may vomit. Um, so if that's your particular area of specialism or interest, you can work out how many people what you're doing will likely be sick or how many people will likely be sick from what you're doing. Um, within, hand, within whole body vibration exposure, we typically use um, uh, vibration dose value um, and it is a, a root mean quad. So a root mean squared squared means of averaging. And it has this incredibly arcane unit of meters per second to the power of 1.75. So not meters per second squared. Um, but broadly calculated in the same way as um, your hand arm vibration exposure. Um, but it's divided. It is an, a dose value in, in of itself. Um, so it's calculated in a broadly similar way to your um, uh, uh, vector sum calculation um, and again it's assessed on the basis of an eight hour period of exposure. What can we do to protect workers? Well the difficulty with protecting workers from whole body vibration exposure is um, not understanding the mechanism of injury but principally the main, those are the four main means of looking at it and really the, the answer to that question is if you think you have a whole body vibration issue starters get someone like me involved because they can be quite complicated. Um, secondly, um, it's really a question of understanding the individual circumstances and coming up with a solution for that particular instance. Um, looking at vehicle seats, particularly in vehicles, getting the right suspension system on the seat can be key to getting the um, the right level of mitigation of vibration exposure. So everybody will have seen vehicles, particularly um, earth moving vehicles, tractors, vehicles like that, that have got um, suspension seats. If you get the, um, the suspension wrong um, and your main frequency of excitation is the frequency, of, is the resonant frequency of the suspension system, then you can actually potentially exacerbate a whole body vibration exposure issue, get it right and you will find that you um, you can effectively damp the whole body vibration exposure. So home straight everybody and I hope everybody's still with me apologies I appreciate it. it's, a, it's a dry topic. Um, so the control of vibration at work regulations, control of vibration at work regulations came in in 2005 enacted and came into force in 2006, April 2006. Um, and the reason for April um, is a practical one in that it's the end of the financial year. So when looking back at any historic issues, it's much easier to work out when people were employed by individual employers by financial year. Um, whereas when the, the previous set of regulations came in, they came in 
mid-year in January effectively um, made it more difficult to calculate historic exposures. So it's a very kind of um, uh, very practical element that it comes in in April. So control of vibration at work regulations. We have an exposure action value of two and a half meters per second and an exposure limit value of five meters per second. So what do they mean? Um, we'll, we'll discuss that in a little bit in, in a little bit in a little while. And they're measured using the procedure in ISO 5349, which basically sets out that measurement procedure that I set out earlier. So whole body vibration slightly different. Exposure action value um, of 0.5 meters per second squared. An exposure limit value of 1.15 meters per second squared. Um, and you can choose between AA or VDV in setting those values. Um, I mentioned AA and VDV before. We normally use A8 in this country. Now, what I'd note there is those values in the whole body vibration are very different to those in hand arm vibration. And the one thing I would say I'd highlight is those hand arm vibration values are based off of a huge amount of research um, so that, that links cause and effect um, and they are directly there's a direct causal link with those values the whole body vibration values we don't have that same causal link um, so uh, what i would say is if you're looking at exposures close to your limit value i would be looking to significantly reduce those whilst in occupational safety terms so in far as the hse are concerned you're operating within their requirements what i would say is there is distinct potential in the future for those values to change as research progresses um, and uh, for you to potentially find yourself in the position in the future that by operating close to your limit value the maximum exposure level that's that's permitted you could find yourself um, uh, being the subject of historic claims so employer duties, the action value, that first level. So we'll look at two and a half meters per second as our reference for hand arm vibration. You determine that your employee will be exposed to an exposure action value of two and a half meters per second, well, meters per second. So if that exposure is below two and a half meters per second, your responsibility is to assess their exposure to consult and negotiate with your employees and look to eliminate or minimize those health risks. So effectively, you're assessing that they have an exposure. They've not got no exposure, like someone sitting behind a desk would. They have an exposure. There's a need to manage it, but it's not at a point where you need to specifically take any action. And I'd just be looking to look at for any opportunities to minimize that exposure um, and to continue to monitor it and monitor any issues associated with those individuals' health that might make them more susceptible to vibration exposure, such as pre-existing conditions like Dupton's contractor or existing carpal tunnel syndrome or existing Raynaud's or existing vibration right finger. Above the exposure value, so if you hit that two and a half meters per second exposure value, that golden number, then the requirement on the employer is to reduce the exposure by technical or organisational means. So mitigate it by reducing the vibration level to which the individual is exposed or mitigate it by re reducing their exposure duration. You have an obligation to provide information and training to your employees on hand arm vibration, how they're being exposed, how they can manage their exposure and understand it and you have an obligation to have continuing health surveillance on your employees. And I would say not just an obligation, but a necessity from, you, from the employer's point of view to ensure that you're keeping an ongoing and observational check um, through an appropriate health professional to ensure that they don't have a change in their condition over time or any worsening of effects or any introduction of new effects. So the exposure limit value, simply put, the exposure limit value, five meters per second squared A8, must not be exceeded. Nana, never, no, not happening. Do not exceed this exposure limit value. 
if you exceed it, you must reduce the exposure value below the exposure limit value. And then you must take steps to prevent it happening again. Um, and that should be an immediate process, um, not a gradual one. So if someone is being exposed above the limit value and you determine that, you take steps to deal with it, like throw the streamer in the bin. So that's a whistle stop tour through the hand arm vibration process, the legislation and the um, uh, effects monitoring and the um, symptoms. Um, I, I've got a bit of a bibliography for you there of the uh, some of the documents that you can look at. Um, uh, good book there at the bottom, Tim South, who's my predecessor at Leeds Beckett University, now retired, um, incredibly knowledgeable gentleman, particular specialism in, no in, in occupational noise and vibration. Um, and uh, it's a really good book. Um, so, um, sort of any questions now, we've got some questions that will come up at the end. So um, I will, uh, that's me, I'll go back to that slide. Um, if you want to follow Dragonfly on any of the social media, social media links are on the, uh, at the end of the presentation there. Um, but in the meantime, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's me. Okay. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, Chris, we've got some uh, questions for you. So we'll go with the first one, which is from, um, from Nick Jones. Jones, should we be placing controls to vibration to workers who are smokers or diabetics or other circulatory disorders? Um, the, if someone's got an existing circulatory disorder, it's a clear risk factor. Um, and I would be suggesting that if, if you've got employees with any existing risk factors, then the good practice would be even if their exposure is not above the AA, the, the, um, the exposure action value, then even, even if they have some exposure, I would be looking to um, undertake ongoing health surveillance of those individuals because they have a circulatory condition which puts them at higher risk of um, hand arm vibration syndrome. And effectively, they could be exposed to an injurious level at levels below the legal maximums. So um, I would be looking to, to keep an eye on those individuals through ongoing health monitoring. Um, I would also be looking at keeping an eye on their use of tools. Um, one of the things to be aware of, I, I, I did some work on a, uh, I did some work for a client where they had uh, got an employee who'd uh, he joined about a year previously. Um, he then um, had some time off sick um, for um, repair to a carpal tunnel issue in one wrist, at which point we disclosed to him that he disclosed to his employers he'd, got, he'd had previous surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome in the other wrist. Now they wanted to understand his vibration exposure. Um, I went in and I measured the individual's vibration exposure, but I also did a set of control measurements with another employee um, using the same tools, using the same process. What I found was that the vibration exposure of the individual that was um, already suffering from carpal tunnel syndrome was significantly greater than the um, completely well employee. The simple reason for that was, in particular instance, they used sanders because this, this individual had reduced um, sensation in the hands due to the carpal tunnel, that reduced his grip strength. And because it reduced his grip strength, he leant in on, on the tool more, he applied more pressure to the tool because he wasn't able to feel the pressure of the tool as well. And in some instances, his vibration exposure was actually double that of his colleagues doing the same process with the same tools because he wasn't doing it in the right way and he was using the tools differently because he had, he had a pre-existing injury so if you've got anybody with a pre-existing halves injury or a pre-existing 
condition that makes them susceptible to house injury, I would be looking to undertake health monitoring on those. Absolutely. Okay, next question from uh, Francis Wallington. Are there any tools that you have witnessed to redesign due to haves? Um, yes. Um, lots of tools go through various redesign processes. I, I've seen employers redesign their specific processes due to haves, um, but not, not a redesign on a tool specifically. Um, I, I did some testing for, um, for South Yorkshire Police a good few years ago now, and they had a particular issue um, in, in, in their body shop. Um, they had their own body shop, which obviously indicates South Yorkshire Police crashed a lot of cars. Um, and um, the, uh, they had a particular issue, one sander um, that I highlighted had a really high level of vibration. They went out, it was quite an old tool, so they went out and bought a replacement tool, they did their due diligence, they, um, they looked at the manufacturer's data, they looked at the manufacturer's data for the new tool, and they then even got me back in to re-monitor for the new tool. The new tool had a vibration level that was about one metre per second squared higher than the tool that they'd thrown in the bin. Um, <laughs> so it's not always the case that new is better. Um, what I would say is well maintained is better. Okay, and um, we've got a uh, uh, we've got some other questions for you, but I'll I'll email them to. You. But the one final one is: Do companies need to use have have monitoring tools to monitoring staff vibration exposure? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that's from the, um, Nicola Ashcroft from um, Cluid Allen. Um, the answer to that question is yes, you are required by law under the control of vibration regulations to assess the vibration exposure of your employees. Now, that's like any other risk assessment. You know, my hand arm vibration exposure in my, in the vast majority of my job, because I don't use vibrating tools very often, is extremely low. So, um, um it is you know for me a hand arm vibration assessment would be do you use vibrating tools on a regular basis no the end that's that's a house assessment i've looked at my hand arm vibration exposure i've said there isn't any the end um and you need to do that for all your employees but it can be as simple as that you know if they're using a vibrating tool in any way shape or form on a regular basis, you know, not like maybe once a year, I'd probably say that risk was low and would sufficient to be dealt with through a risk assessment. But if they're using it on any kind of a regular basis on a weekly basis or whatever, then I would be looking to monitor their exposure um, and be able to quantify that. Okay. If, you, um, if you've quantified it and it's low, then I would suggest then your your period of reassessment that you would look at could be much longer. So if you've measured it and it's like and their uh, and their daily exposure level is one meter per second day eight, then and th there's not any variation like there's been any variation in that I'd say maybe reassess them in four or five years. Typically, I would say um, um, I would say to um, reassess uh, typically i'd say to reassess every every two years in most circumstances if there's any kind of exposure that's approaching the action value if you're in the situation where you're over the action value in, on some instances or even approaching the limit value i'd be looking to reassess annually or even having a more ongoing process of, of sort of constant monitoring um sort of drop-in monitoring within the workplace Okay. Um, I would say those are all things that, I mean, you know, to put my salesman hat on for a second. Yeah, those are all things that we do. We do hand on vibration monitoring in the workplace. Um, we do occupational noise and vibration monitoring in the workplace. Um, we deal with both simple cases to extremely complex cases okay. um, where you've got um, complicated exposure and there's a need to assess 
exposure durations and, and amplitudes. Okay. All right. So, Chris, thank you very much. I think um, you've seen in the chat a lot of comments about how, how informative it was, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As we said earlier on, um, the recording and the presentation will be on a microsite. If I just share my screen now, um, we can see. So there's our microsite at the top and our, link, our LinkedIn sites there, North Wales branch email address and our customer service centre at IOSH, our Twitter feeds there and um, our website for webinars and meetings. So if I say to everybody, uh, thank you for taking part and listening to Chris. I thought it was really informative, very useful. Um, and uh, thank you very much. See you in July at our a meeting on hazards from, um, uh, from welding fume and from metal working fluids. Um, and I'd like to say goodbye and be safe. Richard, could I just add one last 